can you tell us about the supply uh, supply chain situation? Uh, you know, I, obviously there have been lots of things that happened. There have been lots of disruptions. Uh, you know, where are we? Where do you see this going in the future? The, is it temporary but persistent? <laughs> you know, th 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 these kinds of issues. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, well, uh, it's it's very clear that uh, supply chains uh, struggle right now. And uh, of course, uh, the reason for that is uh, we do have global supply chains that are very long, very complex, and they can be uh, easily disrupted. Uh, so I'll try to give you the, uh, the uh, uh, more recent story. Uh, of course, uh, uh, things started uh, with um, uh, the, the factory side as it got affected by the virus and uh, the lockdowns. Uh, some of that uh, has uh, definitely recovered. Uh, for sure in China, uh, the, uh, the factories are uh, operating almost at full capacity. Uh, the Delta virus affected in the summer, uh, July and August, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and uh, that uh, is part of the disruptions that we still see as a result of losing those two months of capacity. Now they're trying to catch up. Situation is getting better. Uh, there's uh, no question about that. Uh, of course, now the question is, uh, will the Omicron uh, virus drive another surge? But let's hope for the best. Uh, the constraints that you see right now are mostly logistical constraints within uh, the global supply chains. Uh, the ocean capacity continues to be tight. As a result of that, uh, the shipping rates are extremely high. They start coming down a little, so that uh, shows that the pressure is going a little away. Uh, but still, for uh, some of the smaller companies, smaller businesses, uh, those rates are very expensive. And it's also very hard to find uh, the capacity when they need it. Uh, the air cargo capacity uh, still is uh, rather expensive. And as the air travel has not, uh, well, it, it picked up. Uh, but again, there are concerns about it. We lost uh, some of the belly cargo capacity, which uh, affects uh, in a certain way. Uh, the uh, port situation, and everybody talks about the port situation uh, in Los Angeles and uh, uh, Long Beach. Uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the efficiency of the ports uh, is uh, somewhat an issue. Uh, it, uh, they try to address it with uh, the 24-7 uh, uh, type of uh, uh, policy uh, intervention. Uh, it's not that easy to, uh, to go away, and I'll come back uh, to that. But when you look at the numbers, uh, uh, typically a ship will arrive and uh, will expect it to be unloaded within a few days. Uh, now we start talking about 18 to 20 days waiting uh, to get uh, the opportunity to be unloaded. Uh, that number has uh, come down a little, but not a lot. Uh, still, we're staying around uh, 18 days. Uh, typically, you come in and you expect to find uh, uh, five or six ships ahead of you right now, or at some point in time, the peak was around 80 ships ahead of you. Uh, now it has dropped as uh, the latest number was around 40 or 50. But still, the waiting time to be unloaded is, uh, is very long. Uh, even if you get unloaded, uh, still uh, you have uh, to wait uh, for the trucks to come and uh, pick you up and uh, deliver uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the merchandise to the warehouses. Uh, the uh, tracker shortage uh, continues to be an important issue. It's a rather persistent bottleneck. And uh, it's a funny kind of a way. There are auxiliary resources that are needed in order of the logistics system to operate very well. And we see shortages on the, uh, in uh, these type of resources. For example, containers. Uh, there are not enough containers. Uh, and uh, actually, the empty containers are on the wrong part of the world uh, where we need them. A lot more uh, <laughs> in the US and a fewer, a fewer uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, even uh, simple things like uh, chassis uh, that are used to put the containers of the truck, I can quickly pick them up. Uh, we have shortages of uh, chassis. So these type of uh, bottlenecks are there. Uh, the rail comes and picks uh, the containers, move them to rail yards, and they expect the trackers to come and pick them up. Uh, that's not happening fast enough. Uh, the rail yards uh, are um, building up and uh, they are losing, uh, they are running out of capacity. So these uh, logistic bottlenecks uh, continue to persist. Um, the, uh, the labor shortages uh, for sure is affecting, especially in the uh, tracking uh, industry. Uh, for example, the, the efficiency of the port increased as they try to move to 24 seven, but still they find out uh, that the evening hours are not effectively used because people don't show up. Uh, the trackers don't want uh, to work uh, in these type of hours. 
so these are uh, the, uh, the quick uh, story. Uh, so when you look at what is coming ahead in terms of the holidays, uh, the, the, the picture uh, probably is not as bad as everybody uh, expects. The big retailers are ready. Uh, they charter their ships and they charter their planes and the inventory is higher than what it used to be before. So in general, from the big retailer side, uh, there's enough availability. The smaller companies are still struggling, and that's where we're going to see some of the issues. Uh, there's a very strong uh, capacity constraints in microprocessors uh, that is affecting the uh, car industry. And uh, that, uh, that capacity is very tight and is not going uh, to be resolved uh, uh, anytime soon. Uh, so that is going to persist. So when you look, uh, you, when you look ahead, uh, the, uh, the, the first uh, 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 benchmark, uh, the first uh, uh, mark is uh, really the, uh, the Chinese New Year, the uh, February. Until February, nothing is going to really um, uh, go away. Uh, so the pressure in the system is going to stay there. Uh, some of uh, people are anticipating uh, the, uh, the, the shutdown of those uh, two weeks, uh, trying to make sure they get everything they need before, which uh, puts uh, further pressure into the system. Uh, what will happen after that, it really depends if uh, these uh, persistent orders will continue to be there. So it's, it's, it's a funny kind of, of a story, but uh, everybody talks about the supply story, but actually it's a demand story. Uh, the demand is much higher than what the system can handle. And it's not only that, there are a lot more orders than the actual demand because uh, procurement managers says they are not getting what they need and uh, they feel like uh, some of the orders are rationing. They keep on placing larger and larger orders. So they make the overloaded system even worse. Um, so I, I believe that by the uh, summer of uh, 2022, the supply, most of the supply chain issues should have been resolved, except of the persistent uh, issues that uh, we see uh, in a microprocessor capacity, which is going to be a, uh, a problem. And uh, uh, potentially uh, some of the issues uh, with uh, tracking capacity, which uh, we have been dealing with them for many years. So let me stop here, uh, Steve, in case you have any questions. Great, Panos. Thanks very much. That's uh, that really covered a lot of ground there very efficiently. The summer of 2022. I mean, that actually sounds pre reasonably optimistic to me from this point from from this point of view. Also, in the earlier statistics you were talking about, it sounds like you know, we've seen a, a great tightening of the supply chains, uh, a, a big disruption, you know, ma massive, maybe in, in some sense unprecedented, at least in recent decades outside of total war or something like this. But that it might be stabilizing, you know, a little improvement here, a little improvement there. And in part, I say that because, especially if you look at the economic side and the inflation, there's a lot of focus on rates of change. But if we, you know, if we kind of flatten out uh, the inflation issue, that is continuous rises in prices might, you know, might back off a little bit. Uh, I, I think the, the system will start stabilizing in the middle of 2022 on the supply chain side. Uh, on uh, the uh, there are, of course there are other issues uh, there are certain uh, yeah, inflation in uh, some of the commodities the prices uh, that are driving uh, some of the inflation there and uh, uh, and uh, definitely the persistent uh, demand if it stays at that level of course uh, might be driving uh, some of the increase in prices uh, all of the supply chain constraints are not going to go away. The efficiency of the ports in LA, in LA and Long Beach is not going to be solved by going 24-7. There are investments that are needed. Uh, there are other infrastructure issues uh, within the supply chain that can help uh, if the right investments are made. Uh, investing in capacity that is limiting microprocessors, uh, that's not something that is going to happen the next two years. So the, uh, the, the, the fundamental problem with supply chains is when you get into the reactive mode, there's very few things that you can do in the short, uh, in the, in the short term. You can do a little uh, readjustment, a little rescheduling, a little routing, but uh, if you want to have better supply chains, you got to plan for the future and make the right investments. So we'd be talking about really years necessarily, not months. I, I saw a story in the Wall Street Journal this morning that said that it was actually, a, you, may, you may have seen it, it was about bicycles and, and talking specifically about all the issues there. And it really, I think it, 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 it uh, is a great example of, of the things you've said, because on one hand, there's a big demand effect. 
It's not that we're producing fewer bicycles. Yeah. It's just that there's so much more demand and we can't keep up with it. But they also mentioned that the, you know, the prices for a, a container coming across the Pacific have gone from $4,000 a container to $20,000, a factor of five higher. Now, as an economist, they say, well, there's going to be a supply response. If uh, costs probably haven't may have risen some, but they haven't risen that much. And if if you're going to be you're going to be somebody's making a lot of profit there, and they they would likely respond. But that's you know building containers, building more shipping capacity, these kinds of things can't happen in a matter of a few months. Uh, Steve, I fully agree. I mean, you are planning uh, well ahead, and of course, in uh, in the ocean uh, shipping industry, uh, planning for capacity is a risky investment. Uh, you're planning well ahead and uh, you're projecting a certain demand, which might or might not happen. So they have been burned in certain situations. So they're going to be a, a little careful of how much capacity they're going to add. But building a ship doesn't happen uh, <laughs> in a week. Right? No. Uh, the same thing in a, if, if, uh, uh, if you're building a microprocessor uh, factories, uh, that uh, takes uh, two years and takes uh, $15 billion. So these are serious moves that have to be made. I fully agree. Uh, it, it will take a few years with respect uh, to uh, major capacity investments. We can fix, uh, hopefully, some of the other issues, right? Uh, provide hopefully more incentives that we have more uh, track labor. Um, uh, some of the uh, efficiency in the ports uh, probably can be increased and can be streamlined. Uh, but uh, uh, the capacity issues, the capacity investments uh, is, uh, is something that will uh, keep uh, persistent bottlenecks. Well, it's just a few questions that came in through the chat uh, be before we move on. Uh, so one question was about the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I'm not aware of what's going on there, but the question here is if the FTC has been uh, studying supply chains, uh, do they have any, is there any sense that th that that will be helpful in some respects? I know the administration would like to do a lot of this. I mean, we're giving my own partial answer to the question, but it's not clear to me that they, there really is all that much they can do from a policy point of view. Uh, not a lot, uh, even, even though there are in a few situations that I think with the crisis, we realized that we're very vulnerable on uh, some uh, critical products. Um, so the uh, so semiconductors uh, was one of them, uh, drugs is another one. Uh, so now we're talking about uh, electric vehicles and the uh, batteries and so on. Uh, so we need to rethink uh, the, the policy at the supply chain level. And what are the supply chains that we want to bring much closer to us? and not be exposed uh, to these type of uh, disruption threats. Uh, I think that's where I can see that uh, this study of supply chains, identifying critical supply chains that we want to make investments to bring them closer to the market. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And again, but probably a longer term thing, not something that's gonna be, we're gonna be fixed in a, matter of, in a matter of months. And then, and then lastly, an interesting question here about, uh, have there been businesses that have popped up is, is, the, is the phrase here during the pandemic that partially filling this gap and are, are businesses prospering uh, during this? Are there some that are actually doing pretty well because of the supply, supply chain issues? Uh, well, uh, they have businesses that have seen a, a lot of demand. Of course, uh, they, uh, they are prospering. Uh, even though the bicycle manufacturers are complaining, uh, <laughs> they're still, I think, uh, they're very happy that it comes. Uh, where we saw with uh, exercise equipment uh, that uh, <laughs> they made a, a lot of money. Uh, so uh, in a certain way, as uh, closer to the market supply chains, uh, they, they benefit from it. Uh, so uh, retailers uh, that work uh, through the online, uh, the, uh, the Etsy online uh, platform, uh, because they have short supply chains, uh, they saw that uh, they're getting more demand coming their way. Uh, we start hearing that uh, furniture manufacturing in North Carolina might be attracting some orders and uh, uh, revitalizing. So those are the good uh, signs. Very good. Thanks so much, Panos. Uh, really interesting and appreciate you sharing this. Uh, it's, good to, it's good to have kind of the more engineering operations research perspective <laughs> on these things that we're, rather than uh, you know the economists with our abstract models. So I, I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you. Steve. Thank you.